you've got a character. It, you, the first part is about you, is about giving that character the intent that's going to drive the rest of the story. So don't worry about you have to have it there at the beginning. No, 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 no. The first part of the story, the first act of the, whatever the story is, is that character getting to the point where they have this clear intent of something that they they need. Yeah. And if you're if you are the main character in your book, right. it's really interesting. It's insightful you, because you have to ask yourself, well, gee, you know, what is my overall? It, it, do, do I? Hey, everybody! And it is another week, and another week means another episode of Leaders Talk. Another episode of Leaders Talk means another episode with me, Andrew Dupy. I'm Chief Relationship Officer here at Leaders Press, and I am very happy to have with me today. Roger Roof. Uh, Roger is the author of Discovering the Soul of Your Story. Uh, Roger is himself a dramatist. He is an author. And what he is going to do right now is he is going to change the way that you think about storytelling. Roger, welcome. And let's change the way that everybody thinks about storytelling. I'll be happy to do it. I'll be happy to do it. I've done it with plenty of people. And uh, in fact, uh, let me actually first show the book. This is the book, Discovering the Soul of Your Story where I yeah. de- detail everything. And uh, when I was first going through the, the drafts of it, I sent it to a friend of mine in, uh, who's a, a theater director in uh, Florida, who's a real good friend of mine. And he read it <laughs> and he contacted me and said, afterwards, he loved the book, but he said, damn you, you have changed. I'm never gonna be able to look at this story the same way again. And I thought, okay, good job. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of background about how I came to it and why it's a, why it's a different approach and something you're not going to get in pretty much any other storytelling class. Uh, I am, uh, my history is this, my formal education is in engineering. I actually have a, I have a doctorate in chemical engineering and I used to work as a research engineer at Amoco Oil Company when it was Amoco Oil Company, I have a couple of patents. Um, and as a as an engineer, and so I wrote in the background. I wrote in my spare time. Had an interest in uh, theater. Had an interest in used to write short stories in college and and poetry just to sort of let my mind cool down from all the engineering education and and equations and stuff like that. But what it gives me, what it gave me, was a different approach. So when I started to see some success with the dramatic writing, and this was uh, some time ago, I was involved in a a group in Chicago called Chicago Dramatist Workshop, play and playwright development community. I used to teach there too. And when I started to get um, some success in storytelling, having not had a background in English or literature or storytelling or anything like that, I took an engineering approach. And I read a lot of books. I've written, read a lot of books about writing. And a lot of them have some very valuable things to say. But what they struck me as doing was passing on information that they got from somebody else and you should do this and you should have this. It was kind of a hodgepodge. Uh, yes, certain writers would have a certain approach to it, um, but mostly it was, yeah, you should have this and you should have this. And it's because we heard it in the past. So you should have this and you should have this. Okay. Well, as an engineer, one of the things you learn very early on in an engineering education is that what you need to venerate is first principles. So one of the things you have to do as an undergrad in engineering is to uh, derive equations that are fundamental to, in in my case, chemical engineering at the time. The reason you're taught to define them uh, or to derive them instead of just being handed them is because when you go back to the fundamentals, if you in the future have to derive something new that that applies to something nobody's seen before, you need to be able to do that. So there's a real veneration for fundamental physics. Okay, well, taking that approach, I wondered if that approach could be um, applied to writing, if there were fundamental elements that you could use to then expand out and and give you an insight into stories that I hadn't been able to find in, in any books. And so I started keeping a journal and thinking is it's funny now having seen the book to go back and look at my journal and say gee i wonder if it's this i wonder if it's this and you see the idea develop and ultimately what i came out with was an approach which i believe is is fundamentally new 
it, it, uh, but it doesn't violate the existing rules. It just kind of shows you why they're in place, but it does define some new things. So basically, uh, shall I go into the, um, you oh, know, certainly. Yeah. Okay. So fundamentally, fundamentally, here's what, what the approach is based on. It's based on the main character. Okay. Well, there's nothing radical about that, except that I never referred to the main character as the protagonist. And the reason is because when I think of the word protagonist, I think that I think, okay, well, there's got to be an antagonist. And mm -hmm. no, a lot of stories, you, you know, you look at To Build a Fire by Jack London, you look at yeah. <laughs> uh, Cast, Castaway, what was the antagonist? It was nature. Okay, well, mm -hmm. nature is not out to get you. Nature is not an enemy. So there's got to be something fundamental, something beyond that. I was drawn to a number of analogies, some from biological life, but the one that, the one that illustrates it, well, first of all, let me go back to, to the main character. So in every story, every story I've ever seen, there's what I call the core ensemble of characters. Mm -hmm. there, there are characters, sure, there's, there's people in the background, but there's a core ensemble of characters that are more important than anybody else to the, to the telling of the story. And out of that core ensemble, there is one character who's absolutely fundamental to the story, and that's the main character. And this is if you want a really strong story, you have to focus on the main character. Okay, so what does the main character do then? Well, the main character for me does four different things. Number one is the main character gives the audience a vehicle through which to navigate the landscape of the story. Emotionally, uh, what, what happens, it's his or her eyes that we're looking through. Okay, nothing radical about that, but it's a good thing to recognize. The second thing that the main character does is he gives us a sense of the theme. That's one of the four things, the sense of the theme, because we judge the story and its theme based on what the main character does and whether he succeeds or fails, whether he or she succeeds or fails in it. Um, the main character also um, generates the story by means of his or her intent, what they intend to do. And, and finally, the main character gives us a sense of story progress. It's painful, as you know, to read a story or, or to watch a movie where nothing is happening. You know, yeah. you, <laughs> it, it's just sitting there spinning its wheels. One of the analogies I use in my book is when my son, who's not six anymore, when he was like five or six, I took him and a friend to see the movie, Bat, uh, was it Batman Forever, I think? The one with, uh, I forget, um, I think it was the second one. And he and his five-year-old friend, we were sitting in the movie theater and halfway through the movie, they were looking around. They were, they were just, you know, checking out everything, not really interested in the movie. And if you looked at what was going on the screen, it was action galore. I mean, there were explosions, there were races and everything. <laughs> not interesting to these kids. Right. But I took these kids to see Babe. I took my son to see Babe and he was wrapped. He was mm -hmm. just, focused on so what was happening what was happening was in batman forever nothing was moving nothing in the story was moving there was no sense of progress going forward in these sets of scenes whereas in babe it's a continual progression so right. the main character gives us that the analogy that i use in the book is the main character by means of his intent and i'll get to that in a second because the intent to me is is the fundamental thing that drives the story the main character has an intent. Well, I'll back up a little bit. The main character has an intent. And in, in the way that I couch it, the intent is, is um, related to some particular treasure. I, I will come back to that in a second because it's very important that you not think of it in terms of something that the main character wants to get. This is a fallacy, I think, of the modern world and modern storytelling. The main character doesn't always want to get something. In fact, there are three types of things that can intend to do and only one of them is to get something but so the main but the main character has a goal always and to me the goal is like if, if you're walking let's say if you imagine yourself walking in the desert somewhere and in the distance you see an obelisk that's and the desert is flat and it's dry and in the distance you see an obelisk well if the obelisk seems to be getting bigger you know that you're moving toward it mm -hmm. And if it seems to be getting smaller, you know that you're moving away from it. And, and if, it's, if it's not changing in size at all, either you're moving around it or you're just stopped. 
And to me, that's the same thing with the audience in a story goal. We get early on a sense of what is the goal for the character in the story. And then from then on, that little marker is the obelisk in our mind. And if we sense whatever's happening, moving toward that goal, we feel the sense of progress. And yeah. if we see, if we, if we, there's some sort of obstacle comes, comes up and all of a sudden, oh, wait, you know, the, ob the obelisk is getting smaller. Okay, we, we sense the sense of regress, but at least it's movement. And if you go through a long passage where the goal doesn't matter, you know, the obelisk is just sitting there baking in the sun and we're not moving, that's when you start to get, I think, bored, unless we're just, you know, circumventing around it. So, okay. So now I've got the, I know what the fundamental thing is. If I'm mm -hmm. going to understand stories, I have to focus on the main character. Okay, what about the main character, though? Because that's easy to say, okay, focus on the main character. Then I came back to something that all, it seems like all writers get taught at some point, which is your main character needs to uh, want something in your story. Yeah. I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think it's incorrectly stated. Okay. Uh, and the reason is because I don't think it's true enough. And it bothered me when I first got it. Of course, you know, I'm, I was new to storytelling at the time. I thought, well, okay, that's got to make sense. But there's something niggling about that, something that bothers me. And then I realized it's because you can sit at the breakfast table and want something. Right. Nothing happens until you decide I'm going to go do that thing or get that thing or whatever it is. And that's an intent. So I focus on the character's intent, regardless of what their you know, want might be, they intend something. What is that thing? So then I started thinking about, okay, in nature, how, how not only how people operate, but how animals operate, even down to, I've got an example in the book of a one-celled organism that, that goes toward light. Um, but the, 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 one of the analogies, again, that I use in the book that I, I think is really illustrative is you think of, if you think of a football game, let's say an American football game. Okay. And you say the treasure is to be, to, is the scoreboard lead. That's the only thing the teams are playing for is the scoreboard lead, right? That's the, right. you, you want to have that by the time runs out and that's the treasure. If you've got that, you're golden. So at, at the start of the, the game, both sides, they've never had the lead before in this particular game. And mm -hmm. so now what they're trying to do is they're trying to acquire that lead. Okay. So one scores and it goes ahead. Great. Now their goals change. One has the lead. The other does not have the lead and has never had the lead. So now the one that's behind, its goal stays the same. It wants to get that scoreboard lead that it's never had. But the team that already has it, its goal changes. It doesn't want to gain. It doesn't have to gain anything. It wants to keep what it has, yeah. which is the scoreboard lead. And if it loses it, if the other team goes up by, let's say, four points, now it doesn't have it anymore, and it wants to try to get it back. Mm. These are the three fundamental, what I call, types of intent or vectors of intent. And that's why I, in um, what I've named it kind of as an homage to Heinlein, but also just in general, uh, uh, in the language now, the word grok to understand, yeah, 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 I to understand, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to grok, you know, I grok that, man. I, I grok, grok what that you're thing. saying. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly, because we read Stranger in a Strange Land. Yeah, we both but, are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, the, but for me, gra uh, grok stands for gain, regain, or keep. Those are mm -hmm. the three things a character can want to do, can have an intent to do. This, to me, is extremely freeing, because if I have a main character if, and I say, well, what does my character want? Well, my God, the whole universe has opened up. A character can want anything. But if I focus it down, I've got a character and I have to couch it this one of three ways. The character wants to gain uh, something that he or she has never had before, mm. wants to regain something that they had that was lost or taken away, or wants to keep something that they have and find precious that's under attack those three things and and so that's why when i when i said before the the idea that a character wants to get something no 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 it's quite often true in, in fact in some amazing stories they don't want to get anything they want to keep what they have i'll give you an example um a christmas carol yeah okay main character is ebenezer screws what is his intent his intent in that story is to keep 
his tight little world view. Right. And that's what he does through the whole story. And it's attacked from the outside. And he's, and so he doesn't want to gain anything. Which, and this is another thing that, that the, uh, the um, method leads to is you start to see, you know what? Everybody operates like that in some way. And it manifests not only in, and I mean, in real life too, it manifests not only in the, the intent that drives the story, it manifests in how the character lives and their own personality. For example, and, and Scrooge in A Christmas Carol is a great example. Because here's a character that in the story, he's, a, he's what I call a keep character. And mm-hmm. his treasure is his tight little world view and his ability to, be, um, to not let anybody in. And, and be the bah humbug guy, right? Okay, right. well, he, he's a wealthy man. Well, we've seen all sorts of stories with wealthy men, you know, Gordon Gecko, or, you know, name 10 more. Um, but how does, how does his wealth manifest in the story? It doesn't manifest, he's not like Gordon Gecko wanting to go out and get, yeah. get, get, acquire, acquire, acquire. Yeah, he's a miner. Yeah. He's all about keeping what he has. Yeah. And that and it completely aligns. It's a, it's brilliance on Dickens' part. It completely aligns with the story. You know, they say he was a miserly man, and he wouldn't let he wouldn't let his assistant, you know, use an extra piece of coal or something. He was so that's what that in, entire story is about. It's a keep story, and then you see regain stories. But one of the things that comes out of this is because you can having this as the fundamental thing so looking at the main character saying okay my character i I need to know what his what his intent is to gain something regain something or keep something and then i need to know what that is what his treasure is and it might not be something external it might be something Mm. like inner peace it could be something like um like um a regain character could want to uh make amends and have family again you know maybe he's lost his family whatever whatever the situation is um regain regain, keep or uh, gain regain or keep but then you get into the theme ultimately the second part of the book is all about theme and how the main character carries the theme and the main character carries the theme based on what is the outcome of his or her intent and how do we the audience feel about it that's one of the things i love about the approach is things are defined by the audience not by right. the story not by the writer they're defined by the audience and and a christmas carol is a terrific example of of that because if you look at it that way you can take a binary approach that if you have a main character who has an intent to gain regoing or keep They will either succeed or they will fail by the end of the story. And the audience will either be pleased with the outcome or they'll be disappointed with the outcome. Now in in A Christmas Carol, does Scrooge succeed or fail in his attempt? No, he fails. He fails. <laughs> but, 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 to great, but to great success in the eyes of the And reader. we're happy. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The reader he loves fails. He fails. <laughs> he fails and we're happy. And I think, isn't that fascinating? You know, you don't have have to have a story where the main character succeeds in whatever they want to do, and that makes us happy. No, sometimes we want them to fail. Another really good example of that is what I think is one of the best movies ever made, which is Casablanca. Oh, yeah. Because Rick Blaine is a keep character. Again, he has, because of things that have happened in the past, he's isolated himself in Casablanca. He runs a thing. He doesn't want to let anybody in. He even, he won't help Ugarte, you know, uh, Peter Lorre's character. He's, he's just, and then here comes Ilsa, boom, from out of the past, you know, this meteor who's going to rock his world. And everybody's trying to get him to open up and to, you know, take part in it again, participate in it. Especially, so you've got Victor Laszlo, who is very much about, you have to get involved. You have to get involved. Rick, oh, I'm not going to get involved. Uh, Ilsa represents the temptation to get back involved. And so he's a keep character, again, like Scrooge. And in the end, does he succeed or does he fail? He he fails. fails. I mean, yeah, yes. He He fails. And and once again, he doesn't want to do, he ends up doing. (laughs) He ends up doing. And we're happy about it. So that's, and that's the theme of the story because that allows us to convey, that allows the writers to convey 
you know what, the path that he was taking, the intent that he had, that's not healthy. So we're going to show you a story and we're going to get you involved in a story with, with other people who have some relationship to that intent, this core ensemble. And then we're going to show you an outcome. And by that outcome, we're giving you advice that you should live a certain way. And that's, that's one of the things that I think about theme is the theme, um, you know, it's easy when you're writing a story, whether it's a dramatic, um, you know, a screenplay or a play or, or a novel or whatever, it's easy to think, okay, I want, I want a grand theme here. When you think about grand themes, you think about, uh, you know, something that could be writ larger along, along the sky. Uh, yeah. you know, this is a grand theme. To me, no. To me, the best theme, when I think of, of what, what's the theme that I'm giving to the reader, I'm thinking, you know what, we're just sitting over coffee. We're just sitting across the table from each other over coffee. And I'm thinking, you know what, I've heard what you, what's going on in your life. Just consider this. That's all. You know, it's something quiet. It's something that a friend would give. And you can convey that in this type of story and theme. So there are all sorts of of uh, implications to this, all sorts of applications to the approach. For example, even the definition of, of the first act, it, um, this approach allows you to explicitly define the first act of any story, which is when the audience knows who the main character is, what they intend, and why the first act is over. And now we're in the second act. That's all it is. So the first, the first act of any story is it can be looked at as the story of how did so and so come to intend X? Because that's the other thing. It's it's also easy if if you are a writer, it can be easy to make what I consider the error is I let's I have a let's say I couch it in the the what I consider the ancient terms. You know, you've got a character who wants something, and you come to the you come to the story and you think, okay, my character wants something, something. How is this going to develop? Well. The character doesn't come into the story want intending a particular thing. There is a point at which the inciting incident where the main character acquires or is given their intent, whatever that happens to be. And the inciting incident is all part of the first the first act. So that's another error that this allow this sort of method allows you to overcome is hmm. you don't go into the story thinking, OK, I have a character who already has this intent. No. You've got a character, it, you, the first part is about you, it, is about giving that character the intent that's going to drive the rest of the story. So don't worry about you have to have it there at the beginning. No, 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 no. The first part of the story, the first act of the, whatever the story is, is that character getting to the point where they have this clear intent of something that they, they need. Yeah. What fascinates me, and I, I love that, Ladies and gentlemen, I, I let Roger go for a while there because there's so much practical stuff in that that works, first of all, for fiction, but you know, also some of the people that are listening in the audience like, well, how does that apply to nonfiction? And I was thinking the entire time, how does it not apply? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. In fact, you know, for years I've thought, you know what, I would love to collaborate with somebody on a, because I think this could apply for corporate training, for understanding people, mm -hmm. for anything like that. If you know, if anybody within my earshot, <laughs> my, you know, your podcast earshot is hearing this, yes. contact me, go to my website, soulofyourstory.com. I'd be happy to talk because it's fun because it's fundamental to, to me, it's fundamental to human nature. It's how people really respond. Uh, right, it, exactly. Because we're, we're writing this, we're writing this because when we write, whether it be fiction or nonfiction, we're writing about experiences and we're writing about experiences in a way that we can relate to the audience because all of the audience has had the same issues. Everybody has suffered. Everybody has succeeded. Exactly. Everybody has failed. Everybody exactly. has loved. Everybody's hurt. Yep. So and yeah, when you're telling a story, whether it be fiction or nonfiction, it's really about just finding the way to relate to your audience and, and relate to them in ways in which they can understand and they can connect and they can actually understand the point of your story through basically the, the, the experiences of the main character. And if you're if you are the main character in your book, right. it's really interesting. It's insightful you, because you have to ask yourself, well, gee, you know, what is my overall? It, it, do, do I intend to 
gain something? Is that what drives me? Am I trying to get back something? Is that what drives me? And you can even see it in layers of age, like young people they, who don't have things yet right. tend, tend to be gain characters. Older characters tend to be keep characters because they have something that they want to keep. Uh, regain characters can be either way. It, it, what it can even do is um, it determines even something as simple as are flashbacks appropriate in your story? Because mm -hmm. flashbacks are, t because a gain story where the main character is, is intent on gaining something typically focuses on the future. A keep right. story, a keep story typically focuses on, on now because now something is under threat. A regain story has to reference the past to find out what was it that was lost in the first place and how it was lost. So uh, flashbacks are, are most appropriate. They're not inappropriate anywhere, I guess, but they're most appropriate in regain stories when you've got a character who wants to regain something because it gives us background about what it is that they want to regain and why and and everything else. Yeah, exactly. And and that can absolutely also be put into a structure of telling a story, tell, telling it, giving a lesson. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. Finding ways to relate, because that's one of the issues that I find with a lot of authors is, you know, they, they ask me early on, well, how am I going to relate to my audience? I mean, how if I'm telling either my own story, you know, if they do that, they tend to run into sometimes imposter syndrome saying, well, you know, my story isn't interesting enough. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. or, yeah it, it's like, yeah. It, which is, which to me is the most patently absurd thing that I've ever heard because everybody's story is interesting. I mean, yeah. there has to be a reason that you're where you're at. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And actually I wanted to, to, to highlight something you said, which I find sure. absolutely true a couple of minutes ago which is uh, when you're learning to write stories or you're you know, getting trained, um, one of the truisms that you'll hear from writing instructors is write what you know, okay? Right. And often that's interpreted to be, well, you know, don't write in a world that you don't know about. Well, anymore, you can educate yourself really quickly. But to me, okay, it's true, write what you know, but you, what you know that other people can relate to is exactly what you talked about before. You know what it's like to have fear. You know what it's like to want love. You know what it's like to be to feel disappointment. You know what it's like. These are all human emotions. You know that. So does your audience. And that's why it fascinates me. So that's what makes it really human and relatable to me is all of these things. My intent, I might have an intent that doesn't on the surface seem like yours or doesn't seem on the surface like uh, a, a 10 year old girl in the inner city but it is fundamentally mm -hmm. because it's driven by the same basic emotions one of the um stories that fascinates me is um whale rider i don't know if you ever saw the movie whale rider i, um, I have not seen it i've heard of it oh my god it's great and the main character is a 12 year old maori girl Mm -hmm. And you you look at this story and you think, my God, I I just understand her completely and I get what the story is and it's compelling. Okay, so here I am, not a 12-year-old Maori girl, and or in Babe, you know, I'm watching a character in Babe. I'm not a pig. I will never be a pig. <laughs> but but the writers related it to to fundamental human emotions and that and they wrote what they knew based on that that's right. the brilliance to me that's the brilliance of it yeah i i i definitely agree with that i feel that the whole concept of write what you know has become a little bit too shoehorned and a little bit too pegged into a yep. as a concept uh, as and and that runs into the issue of people thinking sometimes well you know maybe i just shouldn't write then <laughs> you know if, yeah, it, it, it's if it, if it's just got to be what my particular subset of experiences are, then then maybe I shouldn't do it. I think that's what stops people uh, sometimes in fiction. I think it's what stops people a lot when they're writing in nonfiction is they're just scared that their concept is going to just not be fresh. Whatever story they have about how they got where they are isn't just going to be isn't going to be that interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to feel 
jaded before you get to the point where you should feel jaded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you feel, but it's surprising how, how many to... people are and, yeah. and, and how it's... many in that process are that they that they begin to discount the idea of writing and or the idea of having a book uh, before they even have it. I mean, I've run in, yeah. I ran into that with a friend of mine today. Her daughter is a wonderful artist. She's succeeding a great deal of art, but even her teachers are saying, you got to worry about something more practical. You know, <laughs> you yeah, you're not going to stand out. There are too many artists in the world. Yeah. And I just want that, that concept just makes me frustrated. I want to, it does like you want to, you want to break bring the up. glass <laughs> because, because all that means is whoever told you that doesn't see what you're seeing. Okay. Well, make them see. And yes, you can, you, there's stuff inside you that's not in anybody else. You know, get that stuff out. That's precious stuff. And even though it's not in anybody else, it can connect with other people. So yeah, the, the, the idea that stop before you begin because whatever you come up with is not gonna be new. Well, there is some theories that there are only 36 fundamental stories in all of history, you know, and they just get retell. Well, okay. Should we stop telling stories? No, no, because I, every nothing's been original since Gilgamesh. No, yeah, no, <laughs> exactly. I mean, and even and even then, I'm sure they copied oh, somebody. God. They probably did. Well, you yeah. know, Romeo and Juliet was uh, that wasn't original to Shakespeare. That was a story that had been around for a couple hundred years. It's my understanding before he took it and turned it into great art. But he didn't invent the story. So you know, if, if, so if Shakespeare can steal. Go to town. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it's not even. I don't even really consider it stealing. No, I mean, you're it's right. Just, it's not stealing. Yeah, yeah he, humanity is a shared experience. We're a social. We're a social animal. Precisely. I mean, everybody is connected, and we have been for thousands of years. So, I mean, it's in our nature to try and educate, or lead, or entertain through the medium of storytelling. Well, and that's one of the things I touch on in the book on, my, on the second part when I talk about theme. I say, you know, what is theme and why did why did people start telling stories in the first place? Of course, I don't have any insight that that scholars don't have better insight. Uh, but to me, a big part of it was to try to pass on cultural norms. That was why people told stories right. or to. And even if the cultural norm was don't go down to the watering hole at night because there's alligators there and you'll get eaten. You know, you could tell somebody that. But if you tell a story of someone who decided to go down there at night and you give it adventure and everything else and ultimately they got eaten, that has an impact. You know? Yeah, absolutely. You know? I mean, that, that, that's the entire concept of folklore, fairy tales. Precisely. I mean, those materials were put together because there were practical lessons to be said in there. Yeah. It's, just, it's just like you say, you can say, oh, it's really bad to lie. But then if you tell a story about the boy who cried wolf and the boy gets eaten by the wolf in the end because yep. he's yelled too many times for the wolf, then you find out why it's not a good reason to lie. Exactly. And to me, and then you fast forward to Casablanca and the writers are saying, you know, it's, it's better to open yourself. It's, it's not a good thing to close yourself off to the rest of humanity, to the rest of, to your emotions and everything else. Well, they could write that on a card and send it to you, you know, or yeah. post it somewhere. But no, they tell this story where you see someone who's in this situation and going back and forth and you develop sympathy for him and everything else. And in the end, you're just hoping, oh, you know, please change, change. And he changes and we're elated. That's a very powerful way to get the story across. So... <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I'm with you 100% on what theme is about and that all of this can relate to whether it's fiction or nonfiction to telling your story to understanding yourself to understanding other people. Uh, the whole business. Uh, one thing I point out in the book too is in a really in a nicely constructed story. There is an issue at the base of the theme there there is what I call the issue. And it's part of what I, uh, uh, the proposition of the story. And the proposition of the story could be something like, it's not good to close yourself off to the rest of the world. That could be the story, the, the proposition. The issue then would be closing yourself off to the rest of the world. And the reason I, mm. I, I, I extract out and isolate the issue is because in the story, the core ensemble, all the people who were around the main character, all of them 
relate to the issue in some way, it's like they shine a light from a different angle on it. A really good example of that is the movie um, Four Weddings and a Funeral. Yeah. Because if you look at that movie, the fundamental issue is finding your soulmate. Because that's what uh, Charlie, the main character, Charles, the main character, that's what the story is about for him, is he's he's a, been a serial monogamist, effectively. He's never been never found a soulmate but at his at the first wedding that he's at when he's the best man and he's delivering the speech and he has a bunch of jokes and then he says you know honestly i i admire i can't remember exactly how he stated but i admire people who found that one person the one soulmate i don't know if it would ever happen to me well of course at that wedding he happens to meet the girl who will be the focus yeah. for the rest of it but now think about the rest of the people who are in his entourage because he's got these other mostly 30 something people who are in his entourage. Mm -hmm. He's got uh, Gareth and Matthew. Gareth, it turns out they were soulmates. Even, you know, in this whole group, they were mm -hmm. soulmates. And when, when Gareth dies, Matthew's is, uh, Matthew is devastated. You've got Tom, who's the klutzy, wealthy, uh, older brother of Fiona. And Tom, at one point, he and Charles are having a conversation. And Tom mm -hmm. says to him, you know, Charles, your problem is you think there's only one person for you. I've always thought if I could just find somebody who thinks I'm passable, that would be enough. So that's a different light on whether or not it's important to find your soulmate. Fiona, the, the girl who's sort of just a chum in the whole group, um, she at some point, she's found her soulmate, but it's Charles, but he doesn't want her. So it's yet another light in this whole business of soulmate. When Charles comes to the end and he's he's uh, going to get married to Henrietta, you don't want that to happen because it's not his soulmate. And enough of right. us in the audience by that point believe you should. You're thinking, this is a mistake, man. This is a mistake. So every character in that whole core ensemble has some light to shine on the issue. It's like the, you know, the issue is a plaque and here's a blue light and here's a green light. And every one will give you some little different perspective. And the, right. and the really well-told stories, they do that. You, you look again at Casablanca, opening yourself up to the world. You've got Victor Laszlo, absolutely. Yes, you should. You've got uh, Ilsa, you know, I'm, I'm devoted to someone who believes you should. And Rick, I believe you should too. You've got, um, Captain Reno, who thinks, no, you should just try to get along. You've got the other freedom fighters who think, yes, you, you should. You've got the Nazis who are, who are <laughs> no, you better not. You know, it's, it's all, but it's all about the issue of opening yourself up to the world. That's where it's, you know, I get excited when I talk about the method because oh yeah, when you, when you start to look at the fundamentals, when you start from, as I said, first principles at the beginning and you start to look at the fundamentals, it, the applications just expand. And I've, it's fun because I teach a class online on this and I'm, it's a very hands-on thing. And I, I look at the story, I don't read the actual manuscript, but I have in the course of the story or the course of the class, the students, I have them write about various aspects related to the book. And then we'll get on a one on one conversation and all of a sudden they have and it happens, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back here, but it happens almost 100% of the time that they think, oh, you know what? Oh, it's not that it's this. And it's like a door opens. And all of a sudden their stuckness goes away. And they yeah. think, oh, no, 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 that should be that that should be that. And that's the other way that it can really help is often um, when you're writing a story. You start thinking, well, maybe, maybe he should do this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and sometimes it can be a good idea. And sometimes it can just be an idea because you're just floundering, man, which is okay to flounder. Floundering is like making a mistake. You're going to learn. But this type of method can tell you, uh, no, that's completely a wrong kind of action. Actually, uh, this uh, little aside, when I was doing, I did something personally a number of years ago that I called a study in Scrooge because yeah, okay. because I like the story so much. And I watched 11 different films, versions of this Christmas Carol from the earliest was like 1932. 
uh, and which ones were faithful to the story, which ones yeah. were, had added these other things. So we're watching, my wife and I on the couch, we're watching, um, it was the one with Albert Finney. Um, oh, that's the musical one, yeah. The I, musical I did the one. same thing, by the way, in 1988. So. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I did. I, okay. I watched every version I could get my hands on. And, and they, uh, one point, okay. Yeah. Well, the, the, so the musical version with Albert Finney, um, he gets to the point where he's singing a song. I'm watching it with my wife and I'm taking notes and she's on the couch, you know, doing something, watching the movie. And she, he gets to the point where he's singing a song called I Hate People. And mm-hmm. I wrote in my notes, no, he doesn't hate people. He just has this tight little world that he doesn't want to let anybody in. He doesn't actively go out and hate people. That's just, it's right. just wrong. It was a, a wrong note in the movie. So yeah. I'm writing this note and I had not told my wife about this method, anything about it as it developing. And she looks at me and she just out of the blue says, I never got the impression he hated people. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah. <laughs> No, you didn't, because it ain't in the story and it's inconsistent with the character. Yeah, I know, I know. Because he's a keep character. Rod, Roger, we could go on, I can tell you, because there's so much valuable stuff in what you're tell, saying right now, especially to our Thank listeners, you. because I know many of them are kind of fit sitting and they're thinking about, you know, how in the heck do I do this? How do I write? I think you've given them a great starting point. Where can our audience find some more about you to possibly delve deeper? You can go to the website that I use to support uh, the book. The website is soulofyourstory.com. S-O-U-L-O-F-Y-O-U-R story.com. I also, my personal website is just rogerroof.com. Um, and that will just, that will show you some other things, a few examples of just small examples of a couple of things I've done, but mostly the website, because the website, what I want, when I designed it, I designed it, I built it. It's got a library of resources. It's got, uh, in addition to the classes and things like that, uh, the library is important to me because I do, I have an analysis of this method on over 50 different stories, novels, uh, films. I've got uh, resources. I've got uh, I wanted to, it to serve as sort of a living appendix that I could add to Perfect. at any time. It's got a complete glossary of the, t- the type of language that I use. And it can be difficult when you're learning a, a new system like this. Sometimes you have to get used to new language. Uh, I had a friend years ago when I was first developing this, I have to say, who I, when I I'd finally discovered it, you know, I got this this the intent and the tre- and the treasure and stuff like this. And I was telling telling it to him, we were waiting for some for a bus downtown in Chicago or something like that. I'm telling this. And I got to the point where I said, okay, so you, you think in terms of the intent and you, and I was changing the language a little bit about how you think about stories. This cat stopped me. <laughs> he just <Yeah. laughs> he said he said stop. Don't go on. I, I said why? He said I just I I I can't deal with um with people changing the language like that. I said, well that it, it's curious. Why why is it? Turned out when he was a kid, his parents had gotten involved in a cult and the cult leader, that's part of how he manipulated everybody in the cult was you were only allowed to think in certain terms. And yeah, thinking, I've, read, I've read stuff about that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, man, um, well, sorry, but I have to design, define new terms. It's like if you're defining a, um, a new concept in, in, in physics or engineering you have to define some new terms sometimes. So sorry, but it was an interesting response. One I did not expect at all. It is. And I, I, that, that, that takes, again, it took me by surprise about that response, but it's not surprising because I, I again, I have heard, I've, I've watched a few documentaries about cults and deprogramming. They do that. They change the language. They sure. change everything because it's all about insulating people. Um, well, but, look at, look at 1984. I mean, double plus. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, you, you change the language, you change what thoughts are allowed. Exactly. Yeah. Well, in this case, though, it's a good thing. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, audience, I'm not right, trying to take, manipulate take look, you. Take a look, look into my eyes. Ro- Roger, I would, uh, I think that we have enough. We could probably talk again. So, if, in the future, I'd probably like to invite you back. But for right now, we are at our time. So, I'm going to bid you farewell and bid okay. you the absolute best of luck. It was a very much a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.